Hello, Dominic Herbst here with Restoring Relationships. Once again, to remind you to come to our webpage at restoringrelationships.org and sign up and register for our next Walking Through Calvary. Uh, we are already starting, heading to the halfway point of the current uh, season that we're in with uh, a prodigal spouse, divorce recovery. We have another one coming up soon to be scheduled uh, throughout uh, July and August. So look for it because many people are testifying about what God is doing in their lives as a result of being willing to walk through Calvary in full surrender, full obedience to His Word and His will, and complete trust in God according to His Word. This session today is going to be very much a part of everything that happens in our lives. A toxic soul creates toxic relationships which cause sickness in the body. Here's the remedy. I want you to consider that I'm going to go back and forth from soul sickness, we're going to call it that, to bodily sickness. So sometimes I'll be given what happens to us in the soul as it equates and and causes and accelerates what may be happening within our body. All the research, even for those scientists outside of the Word of God and submitting to Christ, are seeing this inextricable connection between a person's struggle in disease, sickness, and afflictions within their body, and how they're inextricably tied with certain things that have not been addressed in the soul where cleansing and purification has not yet occurred in the place where they've been violated in a very painful way. Please do not make the erroneous conclusion that all sickness that you and I have experienced automatically comes from a certain area of sin within us. However, don't take the risk because it may very well have a root in that or it could at the very least it, can, it will be accelerated by certain things that are not addressed within us that can only be given to the great physician, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we begin, toxic relationships are a symptom of a toxic soul. So it actually originates in the soul. We, uh, the name of the ministry that God poured through me is Restoring Relationships. But it's actually drawn from restoration of the soul. Had I called it that, many people uh, not sure about the soul, spirit, body connection, not sure about the regenerated spirit versus restoration of the soul. So uh, suffice it to say that if you do not have a restored soul, you cannot have a healthy relationship. You can be a born-again, blood-bought believer with a regenerated spirit by the Holy Spirit of God, by placing your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ at Calvary and be born again in your spirit with the promise of heaven and have a soul that's deeply afflicted and even infected. That is why it's important for us to understand that the same Jesus who regenerated our spirit, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's all done by Him. You cannot uh, regenerate your spirit. You need the infinite, perfect life of the Lord by the finished work of the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary, and you need the perfect blood to cleanse you from the sin that restores the relationship with God only through Christ. However, the soul now has to be open to the Lord. And in Psalm 23, 3, we see that the Lord Jesus, he the Lord, restoreth my soul. So the same Christ who regenerated your spirit so that you would be saved will restore your soul. Now we're going to find out what happens if we don't have a restored soul, even though we're a believer, and what happens. So you could be with a toxic person. Uh, I was a toxic person, very toxic, in my marriage and with my children years ago until I walked through Calvary. So here's what happens in toxicity. In describing a relationship, it means to be extremely harsh, even sometimes malicious and harmful. That is harmful to the people near you, even with words. And certain behaviors that cause them not to feel at peace, feeling as if they're constantly in a state of fear and anxiety, and they can't get out of it because what is infecting me or the toxic person will also affect 
and ultimately infect the people around them. Because enemy spirit activity is igniting and accelerating the areas that are not surrendered to God in our souls. And it's important that we know that the same Christ who cleansed our sin also wants the pain that's lodged in our soul. That's why Jesus is also called the great physician. We can have pain in our soul from the violations of what people have done to us. For instance, a wound against you or I. You cannot live in this fallen world without being wounded. And as you have already learned, the people we love the most are the ones who have the capability of hurting us the worst. All right? Why? Because we're all fallen. A wound is a violation against the soul that impacts the three faculties of the soul. The intellect is my thoughts, the feelings, my emotions, and my will, which is my behavior, my speech, my action. So when a wound comes against us, and by the way, everyone's wounded, everyone. Not everyone is infected. Jesus was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, but he was never infected. All right, so now the wound hurts, but it won't debilitate your life. But the Lord will cleanse the wound before it becomes infected. So a wound is a violation against the soul that affects the, uh, the thoughts, the feelings, and the actions. And when we are wounded in the body and the wound is cleansed, there's a scar. Not always, but in most cases, there'll be a little scar there. And what does the scar show? Two things. Once I was hurt, and now I'm healed. Now, a lot of people tend to describe those that are in toxic state, they're scarred people from childhood. No, that's, they're, they're infected people from childhood. If they were scarred, the infection would already be cleansed, the wound would heal, and they would show the scar. So keep in mind, the terminology is very important here. Here, the infection is still very much active in a person who is toxic, and that's because they have an infection in their soul that is extremely toxic. Now, I'm going to shift into body. We're going from soul into body, but watch the analogies and the correlation. There is um, a name for an infection, for, particularly for people that have deep wounds or have had surgery for whatever reason, even elective surgery, put a knee in, a hip in, etc., or a football injury, a sports injury, something of that nature. It's called septicemia. The short name is sepsis. Most of you have heard of it. And it's a very, very dangerous thing to intrude into the body. It is the, the, this clinical name for blood poisoning. Now, blood poisoning can occur from a wound that has gotten bacteria in it, and the wound now becomes infected. So now it flows through the body, and now the whole body is affected by that original place of the wound because bacteria was carried through the bloodstream all through it. So the true name of, blood, uh, of a bacterial blood poisoning is sepsis. Now you know what that is. Some of you probably already did. It's the body's most extreme response to infection. It's the worst of all infections. Sepsis that progresses to septic shock has a death rate as high as 50%. This means the body is more infected than it is healthy. And depending on the type of organism involved, sepsis is a medical emergency and needs urgent medical treatment and is the body's extreme response to infection. Um, and I have the, the citation here, and you can find this online. Uh, some of this information has come from the cdc.gov, uh, Center for Disease Control, and the other is dot, doctor.com. So those are two of the sources. So I want to make sure you're getting it right from the medical professionals. Um, most extreme uh, uh, experience of infection within the body. Uh, it is life-threatening. Uh, it happens when an infection you already have triggers a chain reaction. Notice that word, chain reaction. It, uh, the chain reaction now, see, bacteria and infection is not satisfied with staying in one place. It's going to spread. It's like darkness of enemy spirit activity. It's not satisfied with, with influencing even the believer in a particular area of his, his or her soul so that they can just keep that person from really operating in the abundant life of their destiny, that they cripple them, so to speak, with the soul sickness within them. But see, the chain reaction in enemy spirit activity, just like the chain reaction in sepsis, will ultimately cause an, a dark influence over spouse, 
if the person's married, over children, over the whole family, over the extended family, over the people that they work with, over the people that they supervise, and so on. Why? It's a chain reaction. That infection within me creating the toxicity in my soul is I'm going to be a carrier. I'm not just going to be one who embodies it. I'm going to carry it and take it other places and touch other people with it. And everywhere I go and touch, I'm going to contaminate them. Why? Because I'm contaminated. It's bigger than me. There are some sicknesses that are bigger than us. We have to get to the doctor, to the hospital, and that we need a physician. The same with being contaminated by this uh, infection within the soul. We need the great physician to bring cleansing and purification through repentance and godly sorrow. So during sepsis, back to the body, your immune system which defends you from germs, releases a lot of chemicals into your blood. It's, you're going kaflui here, whatever that word means. You're just not in a stable place. You are now unbalanced within you. Your body is automatically doing secretions because it's not responding properly. And that's what happens in the soul when you're toxic. You're not responding properly to situations and triggering events and people that are asking you a question or want to have a, a discussion with you and you have this hyper alert sense because of the toxicity in you to come against them or to create conflict or to provoke them or to uh, shut them down or to hurt them in any way you can. Why? The infection in you is reaching out to bring infection within them. And this is why it's, it becomes bigger than you. It's part of the stronghold that the enemy has formed around you in a particular place of your soul where you were wounded. But you've long been infected now. Be very careful. So back and forth here to the soul and to the body. This in the body, the chemicals in your blood will trigger widespread inflammation that can lead to organ damage. When you have organ damage, they start to shut down. Mm. You're at death's door. You're on life support. At that point, and then clots occur. What do they do from sepsis? Clots can occur. They reduce blood flow to your limbs and internal organs. Why? It stops the blood from flowing through. Bible says the life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. It carries oxygen for breath to keep the body healthy. So it goes on living. And it creates new, It has nutrients in it that, that uh, nurture and strengthen every organ of the body, every part of the tissue, all the cells, so they can continue to grow and, and, and to multiply. But all this surging through the system of a person with sepsis is death. Death is surging through it. All that's surging through the soul with a person who's toxic is death and darkness of the enemy spirit activity. Now watch when they start to collide. They start to collide and now what happens in the soul begins to happen within the body. But let me finish with some symptoms first on the physical sepsis. Symptoms of blood poisoning. Uh, this is from familydoctor.org. Chills and shivering. This should not surprise you. Well, I've had that and fever and that sort of thing. Now, don't get so scared that you run to the doctor because you might have some of these symptoms. But also recognize that you always inquire the Lord. Lord, what's happening here? Whatever. So I'm not telling you not to do that. I'm just saying you know, uh, uh, let the Lord bring proper reasoning to you. Chills, shivering, sudden fever, moderate to high temperature, fast heartbeat. Now, we can have a fast heartbeat when we're working out, but that's for the purpose of the fact that it is a healthy form of cardiovascular activity. Fast heartbeat when you're not working out, that's not, that's not healthy, especially for a sustained period. Um, rapid breathing, and that they're going to be kind of tied together. <laughs> it'll be shallow and it'll be rapid. Heart palpitations, where the heart will actually at times skip a beat, and it might even seem to flutter, where it starts to lose control of its proper beat sequence. Low energy, especially in children, you can see this. Irritability, especially in children. These are all symptoms. The additional symptoms now start to affect the person's reasoning. Confusion, disorientation, person forgets who they are what their purpose is, who occurs, extreme pain or discomfort will start to come in. The person won't be able to get at peace. They won't be able to get uh, a feeling as if they feel okay, clammy, sweaty skin, shortness of breath. 
and it places the patient in the most vulnerable state and in need of a physician. And that's the physical part of the sepsis, of the bacterial blood poisoning. One in the same there. All right, now let's move to several verses that show the connection between what's happening in the soul and in the physical body. According to Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. If you feel brokenhearted, you're experiencing that because of a betrayal of someone very precious to you. There are one or two ways you can go. You can come under the power of that violation of wound and that betrayal with a response of bitterness and hate, and you become so infected and so toxic within your soul that the Lord won't be able to reach you, not that he can't, but you have to allow him to reach you. But a bitter spirit, a bitter heart will not allow him to reach you. But if you are broken hearted before him and you open up in vulnerability to the pain that you've been enduring as a result of being a victim of terrible actions and activity by someone that you thought you could trust, that you were once close to, the Lord is saying he's close the, the psalmist is saying he's closest to you. He's actually closer now than ever. But the, but the enemy's going to tell you, no, he's left you. He doesn't care. He's not hearing you. Those are lies. Right here's the word of God. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those, saves those who are crushed in spirit. So now you're taking your crushed spirit and you're giving it to the physician. Which one? The best one, the great physician, where all power is given to him in heaven and in earth. That's all you need right then and there. You could be totally alone in terms of all fellowship of humanity around you, but you're never alone when he is with you and he's closest with you when you open up your broken heart to him. Repent of that bitterness. Don't let that happen because that is the sepsis of the soul, that root of bitterness. It poisons the soul, whereby springing up many be defiled. It splatters out on people like a fountain of sewage. It's got no cleansing in it. It's got no purification in it. And the Lord is going to cleanse and purify you in ways that you never imagined within your soul. You will feel awesome all the way around right into the depths of your body. It places the believer, this broken-hearted place, in the most vulnerable state and in need of the great physician. In Proverbs 17, verse 22, a merry heart does good. What is that? A merry heart, a filled heart, a happy heart, a cleansed heart, a heart that's at peace, does good like medicine. It's a person who's in laughter, who's enjoying life, who's got the fullness of the abundant life in John 10.10. 10. Jesus said, I came to you have life, which is eternal, and that'd be more abundant. Some of you have uh, the uh, life eternal in your spirit, but it's not abundant. Why? Your heart is not merry and you don't have the medicine of laughter. Even Ben Franklin caught it. Laughter is the best medicine. He was one bit off there though. The greatest medicine is actually sorrow in a fallen world. And that's Ecclesiastes 7, 6. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. In a fallen world, it's in brokenness and in sorrow and cleansing that leads us to repentance for full restoration with God. In laughter, you're not going to be in a repentant state and seeking out to God. You're going to enjoy his presence and his fellowship. So it's good. And endorphins are released. It's healthy for the body. Laughter is. But when there's infection within us, and the, the only way it's going to be cleansed out is because the sorrow is the cleansing agent. But it must be godly sorrow. It cannot be worldly sorrow. That's like pouring all kinds of bacteria on an already infected body wound. And you wouldn't do that. You have to pour a cleansing agent on the bodily wound, an antibiotic to cleanse the blood. And so when you reach out for the great physician, his cleansing comes through you and cleanses you from the sin or the held back pain that you had never, ever laid open that caused your heart to be broken in that previous verse that we read earlier. But listen to this, the second part of Proverbs seventeen twenty two. A merry heart does good like medicine, which means your body's going to feel great too. But a broken spirit dries the bones. A broken spirit dries the bones. Dried bones are not healthy in the body, not at all, not one bit. We're, we're told we're 97% moisture, water, okay? And, and we're dried up, and you certainly don't want to uh, be dehydrated either. I mean, we're, it's, we constantly hear the dangers of being dehydrated. A broken spirit, though, is to lead us to get the fulfillment of the healing of the great physician. 
But this is a person who's broken in spirit, but they're not seeking God. And the broken spirit should lead them to seek the fullness of Christ, filling them where? At the place where they're broken. Well, he's already in me. I received him years ago. I don't need to... Yes, he's offering you the opportunity to surrender to him that pain, that uh, affliction that came against your soul, maybe by someone else or maybe by an event that happened that was reordering your life, and he's calling to you. He said, I will take that broken spirit, and I will mend your spirit. I will tender to you in such a way and I will strengthen you and raise you up. So a broken spirit, until it's healed by the great physician, is going to dry the bones, going to affect your body. It's going to infect your body. And please understand, and hardly any among us is, is, ha, has not had some form of cancer or a person nearest to us that has had. It's the worst of all scourges. But know this, one of you, our greatest fights against cancer in the spiritual realm is to make sure that we're constantly coming to the great physician doing preemptive strikes. What's that? Don't wait for the affliction of cancer or the infection. Or if you've just learned, you get to that great physician. Do not forsake the opportunities of the good gift that God has given you through modern medicine. But go to the Lord and inquire of Him as to how He... he he wants you to learn from this and the process and the pathway by which you are to go through. Always seeking Him. Always seeking Him in, in order that you realize, okay, I, this may not be a result of something that is unsurrendered, but Lord, you're going to teach me something then. Job didn't really do anything in particular to go through the horrors that he went through. But God knew he could trust his heart, ultimately at the worst place. And Job ultimately said in chapter 42, I saw things too wonderful that I knew not. And so it can be with a person who's going through the pathway of, of the cancer season. As horrific as that can be and painful. And the treatments can be every bit as bad as what they're experiencing in cancer or even worse. But God will have a purpose in it. All pain has purpose. All of it. It may not be something we see right away or, or even down the road. But eventually you will know that purpose. So those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit are willing to do anything and everything that God asks them without resistance or resentment and cease doing things our way and learn to do them God's way instead. Now, if you, those of you that are wondering whether a spouse is repentant or a child who's come back and they said, I've changed, this is a test of whether or not their repentance is real. Because the word says, and I think it's uh, Matthew uh, 8... 22, look it up. Don't, I, I have the numbers wrong. That uh, repentance is to show works that are evidence that that person has truly turned from what they were doing, turned toward God. And the fruit of that is beautifully set forth right here in that previous sentence that I just read. Those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, that is a repentant heart, are willing to do anything and everything that God asks without resistance or resentment and cease doing things uh, their way and learn to do them God's way instead. And this, the condition of submissiveness, this person is now taking hold of the atonement for the cleansing of whatever was hindering their walk with God and true repentance can occur. Don't lose sight of that because all affliction is going to come from a non-repentant heart. I mean, think about it. The prodigal was eating with pigs till it was all said and done. He was in, he was in a cesspool of, of this uh, natural life and, and filled with unclean activity around him and through him. In Jeremiah 20, verse 9, he, the prophet Jeremiah, described his bitterness as fire in his bones. Think of that. Now, he's going from bitterness in his soul, the root of bitterness in the soul, and he's equating it with a fire in his bones. Think about what infection does. You've had an infection in your body, not just a wound, but it's now infected, okay? And what do you feel? It's burning. Sometimes you'll feel a burning sensation. And that's what he's saying. The prophet is saying, this bitterness in me, in my soul, is creating fire even into the deepest places of my bones. He's affected, he's infected uh, in the soul, and he's affected in his body and infected. 
And in Lamentations 3, 4, Jeremiah describes his bones as being broken due to his bitterness. His bones became brittle and broken because of his bitterness. They would fracture easily. They were affected and in the deepest part of his physical body. Now, I don't want to put too much emphasis on the physical body. It's the flesh. It's, it's dying every minute that we live. And it's, it's going to be transformed from a, a, a terrestrial body of the earth, dust, to a celestial body, indestructible. Uh, but, however, it is an indicator. It is a barometer of things that occur within it or even on it. Imagine this. I just saw this. Uh, on a slide on Facebook where this person said uh, this condition that people are seemingly getting more frequently than ever before is called dysidrosis. Now, I, I made the Y long I. Dysidrosis could be dysidrosis, D-Y-S-I-D-R-O-S-I-S, and is also related to emotional problems. So this condition, what happens? It manifests on the skin. What is the emotions? What do the emotions have to do with what happens in the skin? Apparently quite a bit. And this is just the beginning of, of how things manifest. Um, my brother is a very brilliant uh, dermatologist. And uh, the, many of internists and other doctors that are trying to diagnose inflammation or difficulty or uh, scans that they do in the body, they come to him because the largest organ of the body is the skin. It covers the whole body. And many things will manifest and bubble out. But listen to this little clause about it. Possible causes. The causes are unknown of this dysidrosis or dysidrosis, but appear to be correlated to periods of anxiety, stress, and frustration in people who don't vent their emotions. Now you might say, well, I can't go around exploding or venting my emotions. Well, you can surrender them to the Lord and let him cleanse them and speak them out to him because life and death is in the power of the tongue. And as you speak forth out of the power of your tongue, God will pour in. That which pours out allows God to pour into the place where the enemy is using to increase the infection in your soul to create that bitter root. So there are ways to vent that have nothing to do with offending or affecting other people around you. It can be in those precious, silent, quiet moments with the Lord. So those that don't vent, vent their emotions are very susceptible to this uh, dysidrosis. People find it difficult to relax, even out, outside of troubled times. So they're supposedly going through reasonably good times, but they can't relax. So constant stress or subsequent moments of anger and obsessive compulsive personality often trigger the symptoms of the disease. Here are the symptoms. Tiny bubbles that can pop up on your hands or feet spreading across your limbs in such a way that there are tiny bubbles that create bigger bubbles. Individual bubbles that join together to form one. Bubbles hard to pop and constantly itching. What is this? Did I get poison ivy or something or some other poison from a leaf? It is important to seek a dermatologist and a psychologist or, or counselor because they say counseling actually can help take away the cause or the accelerant, that is, to make it actually manifest on you. Now, isn't that interesting? Right there. Who would have thought on how many years that that's been around and nobody even looked at the possible cause as the stress and the areas uncleansed and unsurrendered to God within the soul. I, let me move on here. Proverbs 14, verse 7 and verse 30. Let me give you four, verse 7. Go from the presence of a foolish man when you do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge. Now, you might say, what does that have to do with soul sickness and sin sickness? If he doesn't have the lips of knowledge, then he's pouring out of an abundance of his heart in a way that is not edifying you. And if it's not edifying you and pouring into you and pouring life and strength into you and speaking to you, it's drawing out of you. It's taking from you. And when it's taking from you without replacing something that you need deeply in that area, you don't, you're not required to be in the presence of that person. As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men and women. That's Romans 12. If you're not in a place where a person's 
not going to be able to edify you. It's not necessarily healthy to spend a lot of time with them. Could God use you to go to them and speak a word of truth, a word of wisdom, a word fitly spoken? Absolutely. That's not what this is saying. This is saying you don't spend a whole lot of time there. Take a look at the first psalm. Don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Don't sit in the presence of people who are taking and sucking life out of you at the soul level because you're going to feel life going out of you in the physical. You'll go home and you'll feel like you have to take a nap for, for a long time in order to get all that strength back. And then that verse 30, look at this. Same proverb, Proverb 14. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy, which is also bitterness, envy is rottenness to the bones. How many times have we seen the, the, the uh, writer uh, of the scriptures, which the author is the Holy Spirit, equate bitterness and infection and uh, toxicity to rotten in the bones, at the core of the bones? Do you know what the bones do? They generate in the marrow the cell, the blood cells. Interesting. So if the enemy can get to the core of the blood where it's, where it's manufactured, where it's made, and he can infect that area, that means all the blood coming out is infected. And, and that's why I think all this is so important that we be properly awakened and alert to what the Lord is telling us with our body oftentimes as a barometer of something that is yet unaddressed in the soul. So again, the same time that you go seek out your human physician for the body, the ailment, the affliction, seek out the great physician for his wisdom and for his anointing to show you what God wants to show you as a result of what's manifesting in you or out of you. Don't take the risk of trying to figure it out on your own, in your own strength. We are too limited. We're finite. We don't have the wisdom that God has. And he says, if you, re you receive not because you ask not. So you ask him. He said, if you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with all of your heart, how serious is this to you? I'll show you. But I set this up for you to be drawn to me. I'm drawing you. And if you think about coming to me, don't think again. Just obey. Just come to me. Come before me. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That weight on your soul is creating a woundedness that, sh that you wouldn't have to have or endure. I'll take this from you. And now, and you've heard this one, I'm sure, many times, James 5, verse 14, is any sick among you? Now, hear it in a, in a different sort of, not different context, because it's always the same in terms of the application for the sick. If there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. That is to set him apart, consecrate him. He's fully God's here. He's among us. We're praying. Praying, we're interceding, but we're giving him to the, the great physician fully. We're not kind of helping the great physician. We're presenting him to the great physician, anointing him, setting him apart just for God and praying. And the prayer of faith, verse 15, shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Notice the inextricable connection. He could have a root of bitterness or she. And, 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 and they, it's possible to have um, a condition in the soul that the enemy has put a shroud over and blinded you to. And you might be saying, no, I'm, cool. I'm all good here with my feelings toward you know, my father, my mother, my spouse, my brother, my sister. Don't take that risk. Don't say, I'm all good. Don't, don't. Because if, you, if you're being blinded, you're going to say you're all good when you're not. You won't be lying, but you will be saying something that isn't true. Now, it's not a, a, an intentional lie. It's a lie of, of um, deception, that you're being deceived. Don't take the risk. And you might say, well, no, I know it's not that. Oh, boy, as soon as you do that, you're, you're, you're raw meat to the enemy. He owns you. Because you just blocked yourself from seeing what could very well be the truth. I know it's not that. How can you know that? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The mind is the battleground of the enemy. The mind is the place most vulnerable for the enemy to put the darkness and the blindness into. If a man hates his brother, 1 John 2, 9-11, he walks in darkness. 
He stumbles because he knows not where he is going. And the darkness has blinded his eyes. You know what the Greek is in that verse? His mind's eye. And that's written to the believer. Okay? John was talking to the brethren that they had hate in their soul, but they were blessing God. They were saying, I love the Lord, but that guy right there, he's a scoundrel, and I'd like to throw a brick through his window. That is bitterness coming out of the soul while righteousness is being poured into your spirit. James even said it. How do you bless God and curse man made after the similitude of God? That is in God's image. How do you do that? Does the same water pour forth bitter and sweet water? No. Does light have fellowship with darkness? No. So be careful because it, it, when you're coming forth on this, and this is why verse 16, I think, is in there. So let me do verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And let me read it again. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven. So he's there for repentance too for his soul so that nothing is hindering the fixing of his body. I had all kinds of bodily healing. I think I mentioned it at the beginning. After I was restored in soul from bitterness for uh, uh, childhood sexual abuse by a neighbor and also towards my dad. I, I, and it was my sin. I had bitterness toward him. And, but I didn't know it. If you'd asked me, I wouldn't have been lying to you when I said, no, I don't have it. I was blind. That's why we can't take the risk anymore. Be careful here. So this verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. This accountability between each other allows for you to be strengthened in your commitment to stand against, to be to, be, to sustain in repentance and stand against the temptation of the enemy to draw you back into the place where you once were or draw you into a new place. He always changes the bait. If he can't get, with, get you with the old bait, he'll change the bait to get you to come out there, bait of Satan. You know, um, John Bevere has a great, great book on that. Um, but he'll find the bait that, you, that will draw you. So we have to be armored and we have to be surrounded uh, in the fellowship of believers. And the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So powerful those three verses with regard to the connection of the soul uh, toxicity and the body uh, infection and body sickness. So consider this now. The loss of breath in the soul can actually lead to loss of breath in the body. That was me. I had asthma and I'm totally healed of it. Um, uh, when uh, in my testimony is uh, it's shared in our videos, my testimony is shared when we take people through Calvary. And you say, wait, can you prove that? Well, it's based on this uh, this correlation that I want to share with you. Um, I, what, what a root of bitterness will do is will suck life out of the soul. Now, does the soul literally breathe like in the natural world? Well, I doubt it uh, because it's an immaterial part of you, but the breath is represented as how much of the life breath of God is in it. So if the root of bitterness is there, it will force out the fullness of the breath of God. The pneuma breath, P-N-E-U-M-A, is the pneuma spirit that is breathed in at the point of conception. That spirit is dead in sin until it is made anew by the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, bears witness with your spirit that you're His child when you come to Christ. Romans 8, 16. Well, if i got a root of bitterness in my soul, my spirit may be cleansed in righteousness, but my soul's infected and it's dark. And that's going to pull out the strength of the breath of God through me. That's his anointing. That's his communion with you and I. That's his connection. The breath of God in us. That's our life. Life is in the breath. Life is in the blood. Life is in the breath. So when you consider that, that fear will constrict the soul uh, and which comes from this root of bitterness, asthma constricts the lungs' ability to get oxygen. It's actually a constricted trachea. Um, if you've never had asthma, you can, you can do a little test. Um, take a straw, a regular straw that you drink water through, uh, hold your nose, and breathe through the straw, through your mouth, run up and down the steps three times real fast, and do not uncleanse your nose and breathe through the straw. <laughs> You'll th you can't get enough. 
you can't get enough oxygen. You're denied enough oxygen, you're having basically an asthma attack. Now, don't do that at home. The idea is being that you get the sense, but an asthmatic, they can't like increase the ability of the trachea to allow that in. Now, you might say, but I was told it's because of my allergies. They're connected. I had those too. The allergies are the trigger that can take people into asthma. Happened to me all the time. Allergies into asthma when I was a boy and it manifested later and I had terrible problem with hay fever. Well, come to find out without any seeking of healing of my asthma, when I came to repentance that day and walking through Calvary, me and the Lord, and I uh, uh, repented and asked God to forgive me, I felt this air come in my trachea and it went like this and it blew up real big. I could feel it. And the spirit of fear, I didn't know what it was then, but it just left. Like the spirit that bound me because the brood of bitterness was ripped away by the Christ. I couldn't take it out. I repented and asked forgiveness for my hatred for those that hurt me and offended me. My sin is what made me toxic. My sin of hatred for those who hurt me is what infected me. That's what created the toxicity, not the people that hurt me. That's a lie of the devil. What they did wounded you, just as Christ was wounded for our transgressions. But he was never infected. What infected me was me, my response to those who wounded me. All of this you will walk through in our walking through Calvary. So please don't lose sight of this. I'm not trying to be brief here so that you just have enough information just to be frustrated. We will carefully slow walk you through this. And that's discipleship. And we want you to know that. Eric came in my trachea and never had another asthma attack. Um, never had another panic attack. You know, the panic was, is a feeling that your soul is splitting and you're feeling like you're dead in your soul. Well, when you're trying to get your breath and you can't breathe, you're feeling like you're going to die. All that inextricably tied together. And sometimes I would start to have asthma attack, I'd go into a panic attack. Sometimes I'd have a panic attack, I'd go into an asthma attack. Friends, I was set free of all that by God. I had nothing to do with it except to be obedient to walk through Calvary of my childhood pain and wounds. Set them forth with specificity and detail of what they did to me, what they took from me, and be truthful about what I really felt towards those that hurt me. But I had to ask God to show me because the enemy blinded me for so many years to the truth that the Lord ripped the shroud of darkness off and put the light on it and I saw my heart. Uh, wow, just like the prophets would say, I'm a man undone. Oh, Lord. Job said, I'm fixing to put my hand over my mouth. How could I even speak as if I understood? Oh, Lord, help me. Um, and when God shows you that, the only thing you do, I, God forgive me. Boom. The healing in the soul brought healing to the lungs, the trachea, took away the asthma, took away the emotional disorders of the, the anxiety, panic attacks. I no longer had the depth of depression. He did it all. I didn't, please understand, I didn't even ask for physical healing. I know a lot of people go forward. But I was one of those 30 years ago, I don't deserve this. Well, nobody does. But you know, the enemy lied to me and I thought, I'm just going to have to live with this. But ultimately what healed me in the body was the restoration of the soul. And I'm going to add this to it. The faith healers that focus on bodily healing that do bring the crowds out can at times misdirect in this way. I'm not suggesting or in any way casting aspersions on their faithfulness to God, because many of them do integrate it. But if they're not drawing that person to full restoration of soul, they can go out of there with a temporary healing, and it can come back because the enemy still has access to the area where he was able to compromise that person in their body. Uh, and that's why so many of them wonder. I wonder why that didn't stick. Well, you weren't faithful or that sort of thing. No, they didn't go thoroughly to the great physician for the cleansing and the purification of the soul in godly sorrow that leads to repentance, even to repent for the hatred for those that hurt me the worst. Because that's what bound me. That's what allowed the stronghold to own me. Not what they did to me. How I hated them for what they did. The enemy was able to blind me to that. And uh, I need to finish here, okay? So now you know 
And as I finish out here, the toxic soul will contaminate the whole family and sickness will come often. Think of this. That's loss of breath. A lot of children of, of conflicted families. There's a lot of asthma that goes through those kids. A lot of asthma. And it's become a normal part of generation to generation. And they've got the, uh, the, the inhaler. Okay. I had that, by the way, uh, 30 years ago before I, and I, of course, never needed it after it was healed. Um, fear constricts the soul and asthma constricts the lungs. An angry father or husband will shroud the children in fear and they will become sickly and asthmatic. The toxic soul will contaminate the whole family and sickness will come often. Anxiety and stress diminishes the immune system. But if you repeatedly feel anxious and stressed or it lasts a long time, your body never gets the signal to return to normal functioning. So a person is always living in an elevated state where they can't be at peace, they can't relax, and their body is in a constant abnormal state of uh, functioning. So they're, they're troubled and they're, they're slightly sick. But in slightly sick, their immune system is worn down to such a degree that everything comes down the pike, they could probably get it. The cold, the flu, and so on and so forth. Why? They have nothing to fight it. Again, restoration of the soul strengthens the soul and will convert into the place of the body certain ailments, I'm not saying all of them, that may be inextricably tied to what was happening within their soul as it did with me. So it can weaken your immune system, leaving you more vulnerable to viral infections and frequent illness. Uh, your regu even regular vaccines may not work as well if you have anxiety. Healthline.com digestive system. Don't lose that. I had these GI tract problems. My stomach was constantly in turbulence. I just figured that's the way I was. I was nervous all the time. So the stomach acid and all of that. When I got set free in that repentance, all my GI tract problems went away. And those people that have irritable bowel syndrome, which is so common today, and there's many disorders that stem off of that. If you have an irritable soul syndrome, it's likely you're going to have an irritable bowel syndrome. And uh, it can include uh, vomiting uh, too often, diarrhea, constipation. Uh, all those things can be part of the irritable bowel, irritable bowel. Again, don't draw the erroneous conclusion that if you have any one of those disorders that it's coming directly from something that's hidden back. But for God's sake, in Jesus' name, don't leave it off the table in your intimate prayer time of asking him. Why would you not? It's just you and him there. And you're the one that gets set free and gets the benefit. And um, cardiovascular system, real quick, anxiety disorders can cause rapid heart rate, palpitations, and chest pain. You may also be at increased risk of high blood pressure and heart disease. All rooted what? In the toxic soul, in being under and in a toxic relationship increasing the toxicity in your soul. I'm sorry, I'm going to pound it home until you're sick of hearing it. I'd rather you be sick of hearing this than be sick of it within you. So if you already have heart disease and anxiety disorders, it may raise the risk of coronary events, final events, central nervous system, long-term anxiety and panic attacks can cause your brain to release stress hormones on a regular basis. Those hormones are there. To, to get us through difficult times, but they're to re-regulate automatically when we're through the stress. When you have someone who's living in stress all the time, they're in an elevated state of what's called flooding of neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitter chemicals are not healthy being in your body all the time. And, and all these things we just read about are caused by that elevated state. And it was, so this is why we take meds. Why? They, they, they artificially attempt to re-regulate neurotransmitters that are getting out of hand, that are too frequently flooding into your system, that are there for a healthy reason, but because they're flooding all the time, you're not healthy anymore. And that you're actually being drugged by your own body. And you take the medication and it's supposed to diminish the cortisol if there's too much, the serotonin, increase it if there's not enough, things of that nature, but it's artificial. Because you're trying to re-regulate your neurotransmitter, your nervous system, while your soul is still in distress. Why don't we reverse it? Why don't we walk through Calvary 
we get victory, restoration, and healing in the soul. And then God supernaturally re-regulates the neurotransmitters. And he puts us into a place of peace and tranquility. You don't need the drug because the drug is not healing your soul. You know that. It can only get to the body. The body is only the last stop of what's happening in the soul. Remember the skin disorder and all of that? Not enough. It's just going to keep coming back. But when your soul is restored, he the Lord restoreth my soul. That's the prayer of the believer, Psalm 23, 3. But, but, but I've been a believer for a long time. Yeah, your, your spirit is regenerated. Praise God. Promise of heaven. But your soul could be afflicted and, and toxic and your soul sick and your body is sick. Respiratory system, anxiety causes rapid, shallow breathing. Hmm, that's a condition of asthma. If you have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, you may be at increased risk for hospitalization when you have a triggering anxiety disorder. So if you've already got a sickness, even if it's terminal, anything that will restore the soul not only will give you the best life as you transition, but you'll be more ready for eternity than you ever were. And the immune system, lastly, can trigger your fight or flight stress response and release a flood of chemicals and hormones like adrenaline into your system. I just covered that earlier. Serotonin, uh, cortisol, things of that nature that are there. They're God-given to help us through a fallen world. But like anything else, if it's there when it's not needed, it, it's not healthy. So... Um, I could give you more here, and this is a tough subject. Um, and, and, and I apologize for flitting around here a little bit, but there's enough content here. If you bathe it in prayer with the Lord, He'll sift out the stuff you don't need to know, and He'll imprint that which will impact you and those you love in the best way uh, through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Pray with me. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, there are those that... Uh, are inquiring of you maybe right now Lord I want you to show me what you want me to see not just what the doctors show me but what you want me to see with regard to what is in my body that could be inextricably tied to something that is uh, at unrest in my soul same thing I'm asking you Lord to shine your light in my soul where the toxicity is where uh, the enemy has covered and blinded me to what you want me to see. Lift, rip off that shroud. Show me the place that you want me to surrender to you for the full cleansing and purification that only you can provide. And Lord, I pray for your precious godly sorrow to remove all worldly sorrow and replace it with godly sorrow unto repentance for full cleansing and purification through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We look forward to your comments and uh, I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.